A session five, we're calling this the spirit of revelation. Dash, David sees God's beauty. The spirit of revelation. Dash, David sees God's beauty. And next session, we're going to look at the spirit of might, how David stands in God's beauty. But the first session here, session five, we're looking at David as the, one of the greatest teachers in redemptive history. That the spirit of revelation was resting, resting upon him. He's known as the sweet psalmist of Israel, as it says in 2 Samuel 23, verse 1. He's the sweet psalmist. He's the worshiping warrior. But the key to David being the sweet psalmist, or the extravagant worshiper, the worshiping warrior, is the spirit of revelation that was upon David's heart. It was the specific preoccupation that David had in terms of what he was after in his life. David was very focused in what he wanted from the Lord. And I believe the spirit of revelation is something that David prized above all things in his natural life. And I want to make that clear to you because I believe as we're people that are imitating the life of David, we want to understand that the supreme focus of our life is to obtain a greater release of the spirit of revelation. What I mean by that, I mean the revelation of God. When God reveals God to the human heart, there is no greater pleasure available to a human being in this age or in the age to come. When God reveals God to the human heart, there is no greater pleasure. This awakened David as a worshiper. It awakened David's spiritual identity before the Lord, so he enjoyed the Lord. It all flows out of one fountainhead, his ability to see things about God. And therefore, he could see things about himself, his spiritual identity. And therefore, he viewed circumstances differently than almost anybody in the Old Testament. Typically, we look at David and we focus on the fact he viewed circumstances so differently. He had this tremendous ability to have confidence in circumstances, but that's a couple steps down the road. David viewed circumstances differently because he viewed himself differently. He saw himself in a way that the Lord saw him. And the reason that David could see himself so differently, his spiritual identity, is because he saw God differently than most anybody in redemptive history. And so when I think of David, yes, he's a great king. Yes, he was a, a, a great psalmist. Yes, he was a a great worshiper, all these things. But David had this unique understanding of what God's heartbeat looked like. And that's what I want from David. But when you study the Psalms, because the Psalms not only reveal God's heart to us, but the Psalms reveal David's response back to God. The book of Psalms reveals what God's heart feels like, like no other book of the Bible. But it also reveals what the heart of a worshiper looks like when he responds or she responds back to God. The book of Psalms is very vital. But the Psalms, the, the thing that strikes you in the book of Psalms was the priority and the focus that David had upon discovering more information about God. He was absolutely focused upon this. I want to challenge you to make that the supreme focus of what you want to attain in this life above even relationship blessings, financial blessings, ministry blessings. Those things have their place in God's economy. But if I had my prayer, I would inspire a group of people in this class to walk out of here with one clear focus. They will do whatever it costs them to grow in the revelation of the knowledge of God because out of that, their spiritual identity will be clear and out of that, circumstances will look very differently. Does it mean they'll never stumble? Because David stumbles. Stumbled. It doesn't mean they'll never have fear because David had fears. But he had a lot less fear and a lot less stumbling because of what he saw about God and what he saw about himself. So we're looking at the spirit of revelation upon David. David's life, you can study 1 Samuel and see the, the, uh, the events of David's life and miss the real glory and strength of who he is, which is revealed in the book of Psalms. He was a man of a unique measure of revelation of what God looked like and therefore what he looked like to God, and therefore he viewed circumstances so differently. So I'm offering a picture of David, the prophetic teacher. The three uh, levels of training that David received. Number one, he studied the Torah. He studied the first five books. 
of the Bible, the books of Moses. In his youth, he was acquainted with the law of God. The first five books of the Bible, that's really all they had in any formalized form was the five books of Moses. He was a man of the Torah, of the Scriptures. Secondly, he received training from Samuel. Last week, we looked at the three prophecies that Samuel received concerning David that are recorded. He may have received much more than is recorded. And I have no doubt that Samuel taught those prophecies and the implications of them to David. And we looked at three principles in the way that God showed Samuel that he called David and how they related to the issue of desire and the issue of beauty. And I believe that David was instructed by Samuel through that particular grid that Samuel understood. But the thirdly, and by far most significantly, is here in chapter 16, verse 13, 1 Samuel 16, verse 13, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David. An anointing of revelation came upon him. Now the day that we're born again, the anointing of the Holy Spirit abides within us, 1 John 2.20. There's an anointing of the Spirit. There's, there's access to divine revelation to every born-again believer if they want to follow it out and they want to search it out in the Scripture with prayer, worship, obedience, but that seeking, yearning heart to grow in revelation. But I believe there's also a, a spirit of a, there's an anointing upon different individuals in the body of Christ, and, and that anointing increases the revelation of God according to their call. And of course, David was called to be one of the great prophetic teachers of all of history. So this anointing that's on him, we sometimes take the book of Psalms for granted. We go, wow, that was good. Where did he get that is what I ask. He says these things about the heavens and the angels and God. I go, who told him those things? Well, the Lord did. I would have liked to have been there. How did it happen? Did God appear to him? Did it come to him in a dream? How did he get the things that he wrote in the book of Psalms? What he wrote in the book of Psalms were absolutely staggering for their day. He took so much new ground, if you will. He made so many new proclamations about God that had never been made by Moses. And I look at that and I say, man, I would have loved to have seen the, the, the diverse processes God used to reveal these secrets to David, how he pulled the curtain back. Because it was more than just uh, he wrote a poem and the poem happened to be accurate about heavenly secrets. The Lord really unfolded these things to him. It says in verse 18 that the hand of the Lord, the Lord was with him, or the hand of the Lord was with him. And I believe that this hand of the Lord being with him, which is the seventh aspect we described in session four of the anointing that was upon David, I believe this is specifically the spirit of revelation. It's not only the spirit of revelation, but there's no greater blessing anywhere described in the Scripture than when God reveals God to the heart. Yes, circumstances were blessed, but this is far more than blessed circumstances. Far more than blessed circumstances. In chapter 3, verse 19 to 21, we looked at it last week, it says, when the Lord was with Samuel, 1 Samuel 3, verse 19 to 21, it goes on to define it as the spirit of revelation was resting upon him. When the hand of the Lord was with the prophet Samuel, who anointed David, the definition of that was the spirit of revelation was the prominent manifestation. It's not the only manifestation. When the hand of the Lord is resting upon you, like Ezekiel the prophet said, the hand of the Lord rested mightily upon me and the heavens opened. We want the hand of the Lord, certainly in blessed circumstances, but we want divine revelation. We again looked last week at the life of John the Baptist. Luke 1, verse 66, we have it on the notes that, that you have Luke 1, verse 66, it says, The Lord was with him. And in Luke 1, verse 76 to 79, and we have the notes for you already written there, it, un it, it describes the hand of the Lord and the spirit of revelation that was upon John the Baptist. John the Baptist did no miracles. John the Baptist never had the palace or the kingdom of David. The hand of the Lord upon John, he was an ascetic in the wilderness. What that meant is God unfolded his heart to John. He heard the voice of the bridegroom and he had joy in the wilderness. The hand of the Lord was upon him that he could receive the knowledge of God. Psalm 27. Psalm 27. We've looked at it several times. This is one of the key psalms. When David gives the focal point of his life in Psalm 27 verse 4, this is the theme verse and the theme principle of this entire study. And, and again... 
this study is a different study. We're not taking every event of the life of David and, and breaking it down in all the different contexts. And that's, a, that's a, a wonderful way to study it. And that's why we have the assignments in the A.W. Pink book on the life of David. But in this course, we're looking at what David saw and what he felt and what he did before God. We're looking at David's interaction with the beauty of God, not just the historical stories, though we will look at them in more detail. But we won't be able to look at near the amount of them we would have if we were doing the course in a different way. The theme of this course is the theme of David's life, which my prayers will be the theme of your life. Verse 4. This one thing, or the primary thing, not the only thing, not that we don't say yes to the secondary issues, not that we don't even pursue the secondary issues of life, and even the secondary issues of God's blessing. If they're from God, they're good, and they should be pursued. We just want to pursue them secondary. That's the key. The problem in the body of Christ is secondary things have become primary, and primary things have become secondary, and the whole body of Christ has been weakened because of that one disorder of priorities right there. David wanted all the days of his life in the past tense, I have desired this, and I will in the future seek it. That I would dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. He would dwell in proximity to God in order to see His beauty is His point. David wants to dwell in God's house, and dwelling in God's house means intimacy with God. Because the house of the Lord that David dreamed to build, he did not build. His son Solomon built it. David had a vision to build God's house, and God said no. David had a tent. He had a little tabernacle called the Tabernacle of David. David never built the house of the Lord like Solomon would build. So when David talks about the house of the Lord, he's talking about proximity to the heart of God in order to gaze upon His beauty. Because there was no house of the Lord that David longed for. The thing he longed for was, was proximity to the heart of God. That's what the house of God meant to David. Because it was just a little nothing tent. I mean, it was of lesser glory than the tabernacle of Moses. In the Old Testament, there, first there was the tabernacle of Moses, then the tabernacle of David, then Solomon's temple. Tabernacle of Moses was about the size of this building. It was fairly elaborate. Tabernacle of David was just a little tent. I mean, there was nothing to it. And the temples of Solomon was a magnificent structure. Magnificent. David just had a little makeshift thing out in his backyard on Mount Zion, which was just five acres of ground. It's where some people came and worshipped. And when David says, all the days of my life I want to be in the house of God, he's not saying I want to leave my palace because I love that tent so much. That's not what he's talking about. He says, I'm longing for the glory of God, the Shekinah glory of God to interact in it, see the beauty of the Lord. But look at Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light. In the place of light, I want you to understand, the Lord gave me the spirit of revelation. That's what he's talking about. He's not just talking about, in, in, you know, in a, in a uh, kind of cold, gloomy day, he cheered up a little bit. He means the Lord is the sp unfolded divine mysteries to me. The Lord himself was a source of divine light to my life. Then he goes on in verse 8 and he interacts and he says, Every time I got in trouble and every time I went to the circumstantial difficulties as the primary thing in my life, God always redirected me to seek his face as primary and to put circumstances not out of the equation, but put them in secondary place. Verse 8, David tells the lifelong journey he went through, the wrestling match. He'd say, oh God, deliver me. God says, seek my face, look into my face, and in that place I will capture your heart while I'm delivering you, because if I deliver you without capturing your heart, you're only going to get yourself in trouble down the road. Look into my face and then I will deliver you. Look at chapter 4, Psalm 4. Verse 4. We're just developing this thing of the face of God and the light of God. David writes, Psalm 4. He says, Be angry and do not sin. Paul the Apostle quotes that, talking about righteous indignation. But here's the part I, part I want to look at. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. He says, in this righteous anger, make sure that the motor on the inside is calmed down and it's really, you're connected in God's agenda. Be still on the inside. Don't let your emotions overrun you. Still your heart. David would go on to say in Psalm 131, Psalm 131, and we're going to stay here in Psalm 4, but Psalm 131, he says, I have quieted my soul within me like a weaned child. 
Many times through the book of Psalms, David would quiet the raging storm, the hundred miles an hour of the inward churning. He would deliberately quiet it. There's maybe 15 references to David said, I stilled, I silenced myself within. I said, stop it. Gaze upon the Lord right now. David understood the act of the will to do that. He says, meditate with on your bed. Because David knew about meditating. He knew about in the night, in the morning. He knew about in his resting hours, fixing his heart upon the Lord and not just on all the difficult. He said, still your heart. Look at verse 6. And here's the prayer. There are many who say, who will show us any good? And then David defines what his highest definition of good is. He goes, Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. Put gladness in our heart. He says, who will show us good? David says, let me tell you what good is. It's when God shines the light of his face, instead of countenance, understand it's the word, it's the idea of face. The face of God that David gazed on in Psalm 27, light from God's face. It was in that posture of wanting to meditate upon the person of God. Light entered in and made gladness touch David's heart. He defines good as interacting in the face of God. Now again, this isn't just a nice little lesson. This is for people that want to be like David. We, every one of us, have uh, turmoil in our life tonight, right now. Let me tell you, when the, when the scorner and the scoffer says, what good will come to you, you can say this, I don't know if that circumstance will happen just like I want it to turn out. But I can tell you one thing, the light of God's face will touch my heart if I'm quiet and I gaze upon Him. I will interact with Him through the process of this burden. The process of this trouble. Therefore, good will come to me in that. Look at Psalm 36. It's one of my favorite ones. Well, I hope, you know, we only have 20 sessions in this semester, and there's 50, you know, psalms that we really need to look at, and I don't know how we're going to do it, but this is one of the great ones. Psalm 36 is one of those you, you, you have to study on your own if we don't get to it in this course. Psalm 36. It's still about the subject of the light of God. Look at verse 5 and 6. Look at verse 5 and 6. And, and on into verse 7. Five things about God that are capturing David. Your mercy, your faithfulness, your righteousness, your judgments. Verse 7, your loving kindness. David was captured with these different aspects of the heart of God. David had understanding of each one of those trains of thought. If you would go up to David and talk to him, he could talk to you, I believe, for quite a while on each one of those themes. He wasn't saying that all that he knew in rapid succession. He was giving you the titles of books that he could have written. Those are the themes. Those are five tracks in the heart of God. Those aren't comprehensive. Mercy, faithfulness, righteousness, judgment, and loving kindness. Five distinct tracks that flow in the personality of God, that each one of them are massive in themselves. And then he goes on in verse 8. He talks about the Lord and nearness to God. It satisfies. The fullness of your house satisfies me. It's God's house again. Is the spirit of revelation. He goes, you give them drink from the river of your pleasures. Another fascinating study that I hope we develop on, I, I know we will a little bit, is on the subject of pleasure, God and David. God's uh, desire to release pleasure. David's desire for pleasure and his ability to find it in the spirit of revelation. The spirit of revelation is the greatest experience of pleasure that God gives the human experience at this age or the age to come when God reveals God to the human spirit. There's nothing like it. He goes on and he says, you'll give, you'll give them to drink from the river of your pleasures. You know what the river of his pleasures is? It's the Holy Spirit in New Testament language. The river of God's pleasure is the unfolding of the knowledge of the personality of God. It's like a flowing river that goes through the Revelation 21 city. In Revelation 21, there's a river that flows through the city. Revelation 21 calls it a river of water. Daniel 7 calls it a river of fire. And David calls it a river of pleasure. It's the Holy Spirit. Whether it's fire or, 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 or water, and both metaphors are used, fire and water. I don't believe they're just metaphors. I believe they will literally be be sparkling crystal water and there will be burning a uh, river of, of fire in the city of God and these two are the river of pleasure the, the river of God's it's when God's heart touches the human heart then the human says the river of pleasure I've drank deep from it
And he goes on to describe it a little bit more here. He says, for with you is the fountain of life, for in your light we see light. What a sentence. In your light, in the spirit of revelation, when the anointing of revelation is upon us, and our eyes are supernaturally open to perceive things in the Word in a new way. I don't mean you have to have John the Apostle's experience and be caught up to the third heavens. Just when you're having your daily quiet time and the Word of God opens up to you in a greater way. That's the spirit of light. That's the spirit of revelation. D David said, when I'm caught up in the spirit of revelation in your light, then I see more light about myself. I see light about circumstances. I see light about people. When I live in your light, I see myself, I see others, I see circumstances, I see time and eternity totally different when I live in your light. In your light, we see light. And this, of course, it, 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 it begs to, uh, to compare with John 1, verse 4. The Gospel of John, when John the Apostle talks about he is the light and the life of all mankind. Of course, only the redeemed enter into it. He is light in life. That was one of the Apostle John's great comparisons, was light in life. And David does light in life right through the Psalms. Him and John are counterparts of one another. It's really fantastic. In your light, we see light. And he goes on, oh, continue. And he starts talking about now the loving kindness and the righteousness. But here's the point that I want you to know is that David was preoccupied on this river of divine pleasure. Beloved, I want to see you get a vision for the river of pleasure touching your life. See, we put ourselves before the fire of God or before the presence of God. We don't use our quiet time, our devotional time in the Bible as a bargaining chip with God. Now, maybe some people do when they're new in the grace of God and they don't understand what, what's going on. They, they go before the Lord and they say, Lord, I'll read the Bible more and pray more if you will be nice to me and forgive me. Or if I do that, would you like listen to me? It's a completely wrong approach to the Lord. I mean, the Lord's not angry about it. He understands. That's where most people, every, every, near everyone starts off. Reading the Bible is not a bargaining chip to get things from God. God's not happier with you and therefore inclined to bless you if you read the Bible. That's, it's not like that at all. Reading the Bible, it's like this. God is, God's Word is like uh, uh, a bonfire and our heart is cold. And He says, you come near my bonfire, your cold heart will be warmed and tenderized. I won't like you more if you read the Bible. And I won't even do more for you if you read the Bible, per se. Meaning, I'm not going to give you more money and bigger ministry. I'm not going to give you the things that some of you want or better relationships because you read the Bible. Now, obviously, there's some, some, uh, some natural uh, uh, results of our lives being changed and then things, the favor of God flowing out of that. But it's not a bargaining chip. The reason I read the Word of God is I want my heart warmed. My heart's cold compared to what I want. I get in front of the fire to get me warm, not to get God to pay attention to me. I get in front of the fire because God's already paying attention to me. Not because I'm trying to get Him to, but the knowledge that He likes me is what makes me want to go in front of the fire. I want to sit in front of it called the Word of God. I'm trying to find out ways to get in front of the fire more, not trying to figure out doctrines why I don't need to read the Word of God. I, I hear people in the church today with the most perverted understanding of what grace is and what legalism is. Anything that says no to sin that presses the, them into God is written off as legalism. That is perverted, but that's everywhere, that, that, that kind of understanding. And mostly the way that there's multitudes in the body of Christ, their version of grace is, God, it's okay to do nothing. It's not okay for me to have a cold heart when there's a free fire and to stay cold my whole life. It's not okay with me. I mean, I can still go to heaven. It's not about God not liking me. I want my heart warmed. I don't want it warmed. I want my heart on fire. I'm looking for ways, finding ways to get in front of the fire. I'm trying to reorder my schedule. I'm trying to reorder my finances. I'm trying to reorder relationships so I can get in front of that fire. Not so God will like me. Not so that I can measure up. It has nothing to do with that. I want to be on fire. And there's only one place you get fire, sitting in front of the fire. And a lot, again, I hear this everywhere I go when I travel. I, I hear these kind of snide, undermining remarks about, well, so-and-so thinks everything's going to be cured if they just read their Bible. The body of Christ needs to get on their knees and begin to read their Bibles. The greatest 
disease in the ministry today is, is uh, leaders in the body of Christ who have no time to prayerfully long, have long and loving meditation on the Word of God. And it's not something we do to have a ministry. It's something we do because we love a warm heart, because we are created to have a warm heart. David understood that. I'll tell you, beloved, I want to give you a vision. And an argument in your soul to go sit in front of the fire, to meditate upon your bed, to ask for the light of His face to enter into your being, to, to awaken you and to set you on fire, not so you'll be rich and famous in ministry, so you'll live like a human being supposed to live with a warm heart before a warm Creator. I'm going to live like a human. I'm not just looking for... I'm not just looking for some way to get ahead in ministry. This isn't a gimmick. This isn't three steps to a happier life. I want to live in the dignity of being a human being that God loves. I want to have a warm heart before a warm God. I want to live in love before the God of love. And he says, put your heart in front of me and it will become the river of divine pleasure. It will surprise you. The water will refresh you and the fire will impart new passion in you and you will have pleasure and you will discover what humanity is about. We can't understand what life is about without the Word of God. Again, I, I, I'm not angry at all, but I'm saddened by the way that the, the overreaction and the misdefinition of what is grace and what is religion and what is all this stuff, it's so, it's so confused by so many people in the body of Christ. And they have... They have figured their way right out of waiting in front of the fire to experience the pleasure of God. They've come up with doctrines where that's legalism to do that. Now, if you're doing it to make God like you, what I tell you to do is keep doing it because you'll run into the truth sooner or later. That isn't good to do it that way, but it's a whole lot better than not doing it because sooner or later, the spirit of, of dullness on us will be broken while we're sitting in front of the fire and we'll go, wait a second. You liked me the whole time. And the Lord will say, yeah, you got it. And say, well, I wasted all these years. Goes, well, not really, because you were so prone to that rejection, condemnation thing. You had to sit in front of me for a while before you could even break through that, get that spirit of unbelief off your heart. Spirit of condemnation. Okay. <clears throat> David was one of the seven great teachers in redemptive history. When I go down the list, I think of seven great land-taking, if you will, teachers. Obviously, number one is Jesus, the man Christ Jesus, fully God, fully man. Then there's three of them in the Old Testament and three of them in the New Testament that took new ground that had never been taken before. Number one was Moses in the Torah, in the first five books of the Bible. There was nothing like it. Secondly was David in the book of Psalms. And in my opinion, he surpassed Moses He's, he touched the emotional makeup of God Himself. It's fantastic. David touched the realm of beauty and desire in a prolific way, not an introductory way. Moses touched it in an introductory way. David was a divine romantic. He lived and swam in that river of pleasure, and he wanted everybody to get into it. And the next one in the Old Testament would have been Isaiah. Isaiah took ground David never had. Isaiah saw things about the future, things about God's economy and His court that even surpassed David, in, but they were different than David. Let's say it that way. And then Jeremiah and Ezekiel nearly said what Isaiah said about 150 years later. They nearly said the same thing. So those are awesome books, but they nearly say what Isaiah... But Isaiah was the first to declare some things in a prolific way. Those are the three in the Old Testament. The three in the New Testament. I believe the first one would have been Luke, the doctor. He wrote the gospel for which Mark and Matthew derived some of their material from them, at least as what many scholars say. Not all scholars agree on that. And then he wrote the book of Acts. So he writes the gospel account, and he writes the account of the early church. I mean, talking about phenomenal new information from heaven. And then obviously the second one would be Paul with his letters, his epistles. He went way beyond Luke meaning he took us into things in the righteousness of God, at the court of God, that Luke never saw, that, that Jesus did not teach in his day with any kind of clarity. See, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very, very similar. John is totally unique. One of the most magnificent documents ever given to the human race is the Gospel of John. Think of, I mean, we, we read it, we think, oh, that's, you know, we learned that in children's church or something, and that is a magnificent document. The information... And those 21 chapters could not be purchased or attained anywhere in the earth except for it was given to that man's heart to give to the human race. 
It's fantastic, the Gospel of John. Then the epistles of John are different than that. any of Paul's. And then, of course, we have the book of Revelation. So we have John in the Old. I mean, John in the New Testament, David in the Old. And Moses and Paul would have been counterparts. Of course, Isaiah and Luke, they probably like each other in heaven. That's about as far as I can go with that. I can't. I want to take it to Psalm 145. Psalm 145. I'm going to give you five Psalms right here. I'm going to tell you five psalms to write down. Well, I, I mean, this is, in some ways, it's ludicrous because there's 40 of them. But, but I just want to give you five psalms to cluster and in your spare time, which you have none right now, that I'd like you to, to begin to read. Psalm, they're all about the beauty of the Lord, specifically in creation. Because David had a view of creation David had a view, a view of creation and its beauty that surpassed Moses in Genesis. Moses saw a few secrets first, but David put the color, David put the feeling and the passion into the understanding of some of the secrets that Moses received. Psalm 8 first. Psalm 19. Psalm 29, Psalm 104, and Psalm 145. Those five psalms go together. They just flow between one another so magnificently. Psalm 8, Psalm 19, Psalm 29, Psalm 104, and Psalm 45. Somewhere we're going to have to figure out some way to make those things mandatory in this course. Those are five psalms on the beauty of God that I believe surpass. I mean, you've got to sneak in Psalm 36 and Psalm 63. There's a couple more you've got to sneak in that list, but just for now, let's keep it at five. Those five psalms take you right to the very f- table of the beauty of the Lord as David unfolds it by revelation. It's fantastic. Here we, are in Psalm, here we are in Psalm 145. Perhaps, I mean, who knows, the greatest of them all. Psalm 145. David says in verse 1, I will extol you, my God, my King. I will bless your name forever and forever. We're, we're, we're not going to develop this psalm because I hope to... Again, I don't know when, how it's going to all work because we have so few sessions, but to maybe spend some lengthy time on Psalm 145. Every day I'll bless you. I'll praise your name. Verse 3, great is the Lord. Greatly to be praised. Look at this. His greatness is unsearchable. David's warming up. He starts by calling them to worship in verse 1 to 3. Then he says, let me give you the menu. His greatness is absolutely exhausts the, human's, the human mind's ability to, and the human capacity to receive it, it's, it exhausts our ability. He goes, the inscrutable, or it says here in New King James, the unsearchable greatness. The inscrutable, I think the New American Standard says. It's past finding out. And David's going to bring us, we're going to look at some of them in a little while, he's going to bring us to some of the places of the unsearchable greatness of God. And when we stand before that greatness, our heart will pound within us. And the Lord says by the Holy Spirit, these are only just hints. Now come after me and I'll show you more. Then he goes on to say in verse 5, I will meditate. Now here's, here's you know, Psalm 27 verse 4. This one thing I desire, I will seek all the days of my life to dwell in the house of the Lord and to see His beauty. Psalm, that's Psalm 27 4, the theme, of this, the theme verse of this course. Psalm 145 verse 5 is the same thing, just said in a different way. I put in my Bible, I put 27.4 equal 145 verse 5. They're, they're synonymous. I put those little references lots of places as trigger points to the beauty of God. And I write little notes in the side of my margin here. David says, he goes, let me tell you again what I do. I meditate. Well, he said in Psalm 4.4, 4, he meditates on his bed. He asked for the light of God's face to shine upon his heart for, so that he could really enter into what was good about life. And everybody said, there's nothing good about life. He goes, yeah, there is. The light of God's face shines on my heart, and that's good. 
Now he's going to develop what he meditates on his bed. He goes, I, I meditate on the glorious splendor of God's majesty. You could put the word there, God's beauty. His splendor. I meditate. He says, this is the thing I go dig deep for. I'll go out of my way. I'll stay up late. I'll buy the book. I'll press through. I'll Xerox it at the library if I have to, to get it. I'm going to go dig at the well. Look at him, what it says there. At the splendor, the glorious splendor of the majesty of God's personality. He goes, the splendor, the glory and splendor of the majesty of what God looks like, that's the thing I'm going to sell out my life for. Well, David, you're a great king, you're a great warrior. He goes, I'm secondly a king, I'm secondly a warrior. He goes, I am a man who is seeking, I'm on a journey, I'm on a lifelong treasure hunt for the beauty of God or the glory of the majesty of the splendor of God's majesty. He goes, if I can connect to that, I'll be a good king and a good warrior. And he goes on and he says in verse 6, he goes, I'm going to declare your greatness. David describes his life mission right there. This isn't just something he says, I'm going to give up one Sunday morning, get up one Sunday morning and give a testimony so I declare God's greatness, you know. It's significantly more. He says, my life mission is to make known to human beings the greatness of the splendor of God. That's what David's life mission was about. Right here. Psalm 145, verse 6. That's what he did. And he goes on in verse 8 and 9. He begins to talk about The different characteristics of God, of His greatness. And this psalm far exhausts our ability to look at it right now, but I just want you to, I want you to see Psalm 145, verse 5. I want it to stun your heart. I want you to say, wow, this is one of the most wealthy, powerful, famous men of the earth in his generation. He was captured on a treasure hunt to discover, the mag to discover as it says here, the glorious splendor, the glorious beauty of the majesty of God. That's what he wanted to discover so he could make it known. And David, again, he was the greatest teacher in history. Him and Moses would have stood in the class of their own at that time. Nobody would have stood in David's class. David was first and foremost a teacher of the knowledge of God. And secondly, he was a king and a warrior. Yes, he was a worshiper. But even before he was a worshiper, he was a man that was absolutely gri gripped with receiving the knowledge of what God looked like. That's what made him a worshiper. He wasn't a worshiper, therefore he wanted to know what God looked like. He wanted to know what God looked like, and it always warmed his heart and made him powerful in worship. People ask me all the time, because of the book that I wrote, Passion for Jesus. Everywhere I go, they say, or not everywhere, but just the common question, how do you get passion for Jesus? I said, I can tell you in one sentence where to get passion for Jesus. To see what God looks like. Nobody can see what God looks like without wanting to be near Him in a radical way. Nobody can see what God looks like without eventually seeing what they look like to God. And when those two things happen, a chemical reaction takes place in your emotions. Our emotional chemistry just absolutely explodes in a positive way. and We become extravagant worshipers of God and we view circumstances totally different than we ever did before. David says, that's what I do. Turn to Psalm 103. Psalm 103. David's giving insight into his heart. He says in verse 1, Bless the Lord, all that's within me, bless His holy name. When it says His name, he's talking about what God's personality is like. When it says the name of God, put the personality of God. Put that phrase in there. What God looks like. He goes on and describes some of the blessings. And then in verse 4, he makes a very significant statement. He says, He redeems our li your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercy. Here's David, the great king of the earth. There's no king mightier than David at this point in time. And when you looked at David, you could have said, David, tell us about your life. Aren't you the one that's the, that the prophet Samuel anointed? Yeah. Uh, you were crowned at Hebron at one, when you were 30. Yeah, I was. It was really something, quite an experience. Well, seven years later, when you were 37, you were crowned in Jerusalem over all of Israel with the power of God. He goes, yeah. He says, you're the wealthiest man in the, in the nation, possibly in the nations of the earth. You're a mighty warrior. You're famous. Tell us about yourself. David says, I see one primary crown on my head. I'm crowned with the love of God. That's who I am. 
He goes, you guys can call me king of Israel. That's fine. But the crown that I think about in my life is I'm crowned with the mercy and the unfolding of the love of God to my spirit. That was the power of David's life. The crown that David walked under was a crown of revelation, not a crown of position. David's identity was in this crown right here. David cared so much more about being crowned and the unfolding of the love of God to his heart because when God's love was revealed to his heart, it made him a lover of God. You know, it's a two-way thing. You can't have one without the other. There's a sequence. When you know that God loves you, then you begin to love God. It's two sides of one coin. You can't really separate the two. You focus people in on loving God. They, I mean, on receiving the love of God, they will become lovers of God. David's identity was in this crown. David's writing Psalm 103, I believe, towards the end of his life. And he says, that is the crown that identifies me. I got money, power, wealth, anything that a man could want, I have it. That's not the crown I think of. Because I got a spirit of revelation upon me. I got a crown resting upon me. I know what God looks like. I can feel God. And I feel love for God. That's the crown that I wear. This is David's identity. This is a statement of his identity. When Absalom rose up against David, David's in his 50s, late 50s. He's been king for many years. Absalom, his son, rises up against him. David leaves the city. The army says, what are you doing leaving the city? You can whip that little guy. I mean, he's your son. You are so much better of a warrior than him. The whole nation's behind you. He says, I, I just want to... I don't care. I, that's not, I, don't, I never wanted to be king anyway. King isn't what, the, isn't what I signed up for. I said, I'll go out of the city, and if God wants to take care of Absalom, he'll take care of Absalom. If God, didn't want to take, if God wants Absalom to have the city, he can have the city. He goes, I don't really care about being king. All these other men are killing and murdering and conniving to be king. David's king. He could wipe out Absalom in a second, just like he could have wiped out Saul's son, Ishbosheth. When Saul died, he had no rivals to, to the kingdom of Israel. But he let that weakling little son of Saul take it for seven years. He goes, I don't care, you guys. I'll, I don't really want to be king. I want to be crowned. David was on a life mission in God. That's the thing I love about David. That's where John the Apostle was. In John 21, verse 20, the very last paragraph of the Gospel of John. Here's 21 large chapters of the Gospel of John. Matter of fact, why, why don't we turn there? This is as we close this session here. John 21. Look at verse 20. Peter turned around and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following him, who had also leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one that betrays you? Those are three of the most dramatic statements in, the, in the John the Apostle's life about himself. Here's John the Apostle. He's about 90-some years old. He's already written the book of Revelation. Most scholars think he wrote the Gospel of John last. He's in his late 90s. John the Apostle, I mean, wow. He's been an apostle of Jesus for 60 years. They, all the other ones have been martyred. They're, they're, they're long gone. Most of them have been gone for 20, 30 years. He's in a class of his own. He's already seen the book of Revelation. <laughs> Hello? He's already seen the book of Revelation in living color before him. John writes the final things of his life. This is it. This is how John's going down in history. John's the one with... Peter that led the great Pentecost revival in Jerusalem. I mean, 60 years. He led the great outpouring of the Spirit. I mean, we're not talking about Toronto and Pensacola. We're talking about Jerusalem in the book of Acts. He was there. He was one of the main guys. He went to Samaria after that, and the revival broke out in Samaria in Acts 8. He went on into Ephesus after Paul was there some years, became the revival center of the earth, Ephesus. Far, the church of Ephesus far surpassed the church of Jerusalem. Like in the 60s and the 70s A.D. The church of Jerusalem was scattered in 70 A.D. And the church of Ephesus far surpassed it in power. John was the bishop. He was the main guy there. So it's some 20, 25 years later. Who knows? Something like that later. John's at the end of his life in his 90s. John hung out with the Apostle Paul. John knew Peter, the rock. I mean, the main guy. I mean, the two main guys. Jesus' mother, Mary, lived in John's house till her death for several decades. 
Now, what kind of connections would you have if you hung out with Peter, Paul, and Mary? No, seriously, I couldn't resist that. I mean, what kind of connections would you have if you were good friends with Paul the Apostle, Jesus' mother lived in your house, and Peter was your best friend? I mean, yeah, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't get any better than that if, you, if, you're, you know, if you're trying to hang out with cool guys. No doubt. It doesn't get better than that. Peter said, John says at the very end, he goes, let me tell you about myself. I'm not the guy that was at Pentecost and Samaria and the Ephesians and the Great Revival. I'm not the guy that hung out with the noble people of history. No. He goes, I'm not even the guy that saw the book of Revelation, mostly. That's not mostly even what I'm about. He goes, I'm the one that Jesus likes. Bottom line. He says, who am I? They, they would walk, oh my goodness, John. He says, listen, I'm the one he loves. I'm the one that God likes. That's who I am. That's who I am. No, 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 you're the great revival leader. Of no, no, I'm the one God likes, number one. Number two, what do I think about myself? Why am I successful? I lean on God's heart. God let me lean on His heart. And I love it. Yeah, I led some great revivals, and I knew some pretty, some pretty awesome people, and I've written some pretty heavy-duty documents for church history called the Scripture. But let me tell you, I've leaned on God's heart. I'm a lover of God. That's who I am. I'm a lover. I lean on His heart. And thirdly, God tells me his secrets. Because, see, when the Lord told about Judas, you know, we know the story and it's been kind of old news to us, but when he told him this was the greatest and the first scandal in the early church, one of the apostles was a devil and nobody knew who it was. And Jesus whispered the first scandal, he whispered and trusted John with it. That, that was a magnitude. Uh, I mean, the order of what Jesus did to there was of great magnitude there. John says, he likes me, I love him, and he tells me his secrets. That's who I am, and he ends describing his life that way. That's the identity John goes out. He is so like King David. King David says, yeah, I was over the mighty nation, had all the money and all the warrior and all the trophies, but I'm crowned with love, man. I see love and I feel love. That's the crown I wear. Amen. Let's stand. We're not going to do a, a Goliath next session because I didn't get through near enough of this. I want to pray over you. We're going to come back and finish this session. Let's open our hearts before the Lord here. The Word of God is seen as other than totally ravishing and beautiful and a great gift to the body of Christ. David focused on sitting before the Lord. That's not all he did. He ran a country. But I want some of you, just as we're praying here, I want you to open your hearts now. I want you to say, Lord, I want to I be a person of one primary thing. I want to gaze on the beauty of the Lord. I want to meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty. I want to meditate on my bed. I want to know who you are. I want to enter the river of pleasure. I want the crown of love upon my head. I'm the one that God likes. I'm the one that likes God, and I'm the one that He tells secrets to. That's who I am. That's why my life is important. Not because of how much money or anointing or how many people follow me. Talk to the Lord for a minute. Lord, I ask you to wash us. Lord, I ask you to wash us. I ask you that you'd make this church a beacon of light for something as simple as the Word of God in the heart. I ask that you would make us a beacon of light that stands not just for the study and the debate and the theologizing of of theological points, but we are people that become lovers through the Word of God. I ask you, you would make us a people of devotional prayer in the Word. I ask that you would crown this church with the knowledge of the love of God, that we'd be on fire to do that. Oh, fiery God, make me fiery. Oh, heart-warming God, warm my heart, I ask you, that I could enter into the river of pleasure, for in your light I see light, O oh God. In your light we see light, for yours is the river of divine pleasure that we want to enter into. And God, we repent of these just mistaken ways. We didn't understand them. Somebody told us that that was a grueling uh, list of do's and don'ts that only religious people did, and it was your word that warmed our heart that we said no to. 
Lord, we want to say yes to you again. We want the river of pleasure to run through our being. Oh, Lord, let the river of divine pleasure enter into our, our spirits. And David said in Psalm 16, verse 11, he said, in, the, in your joy, in your presence is the fullness of pleasure, or the fullness of joy. Your right hand is pleasures forever. David knew about the river of pleasure. Amen and amen. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.